Thank you for joining us today for the launch of our study, An Action Plan for Carbon Capture and Storage in California, Opportunities, Challenges, and Solutions. I am Sarah Saltzer from, for, from Stanford's Center for Carbon Storage, and I am joined by Ann Canavati from the Energy Futures Initiative. Today's program will include the following. We will start with a fireside chat with Professor Lynn Orr and former Secretary of Energy, Ernie Moniz. This will be followed by a joint presentation by the study leads, Melanie Kenderdine and Sally Benson. Their presentation will be followed by an audience Q&A on the study. We will then have a panel session moderated with additional opportunities for Q&A. At this point, I'd like to introduce our moderator, Professor Lynn Orr. Professor Orr is the Colleen and Carlton Beale Professor Emeritus at Stanford University. He served as the Undersecretary for Science and Energy at the U.S. Department of Energy, was the Director of the Precourt Institute for Energy at Stanford University, and was the Dean of the School of Earth Sciences at Stanford University from 1994 to 2002. Over to you, Lynn. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, or morning, or depending on where you are. Uh, welcome aboard. Uh, it's my pleasure now to, inter to introduce uh, uh, Ernie Moniz. Uh, Ernie is the founder and CEO of the Energy Futures Initiative. He was the 13th uh, Secretary of Energy, um, one of the founding members of the Cypress Institute, and has worked at MIT uh, as the Cecil and I degree professor of physics and engineering systems uh, for lo these many decades. Um, He's, um, he's the director, was the director of the MIT Energy Initiative. And, and I, in looking back, I, I think that might be when we first uh, met, but the truth is that's lost in the mist of antiquity. And so nobody's really <laughs> sure. Uh, he was also the director of the Laboratory of the Environment. Um, Ernie and I have been cheerfully disagreeing over the years as to whether MIT or Stanford is the best uh, energy research program in the country. Um, but we definitely agree that those are the actually the two best uh, together. Um, each of us has been known to in introduce the other as the former director of the second best program. For uh, Either way, it's pretty clear that the two efforts uh, are stronger for the collaboration and friendly competition over the last couple of decades. Uh, and it's nice to work together again on this project. So Ernie, we, we spent lots of time working together at DOE uh, to create a a uh, fully stocked portfolio of ways to decarbonize, decarbonize the U.S. energy systems and indeed the world's energy systems. Uh, and the topic today is one element of that portfolio, carbon capture and storage. So how do, how do you think the landscape uh, has changed for CCS since you were leading DOE? Well, thanks, Lynn. And uh, first, let me say I agree with almost everything you said in the introduction. Uh, but uh, I think the change uh, just in these, uh, let's say the five years since uh, Paris have been enormous. Uh, for one thing, uh, the science uh, has told us that uh, we need to be much more aggressive and ambitious in our, in our decarbonization uh, targets. I, I would say that in turn has led to a greater realization about the fact that we need every option that we can uh, generate for low carbon. And that means a very, very broad portfolio of technologies like the Quadrennial Technology Review that you in fact led uh, at, uh, at, at DOE. Uh, an another example is I would say that those very aggressive targets, uh, net zero being basically understood uh, to be the mid-century go goal now, uh, uh, that also means we're going to need uh, negative carbon technologies many of which, as we'll discuss, will depend upon uh, some sequestration. But there, I just emphasize in, the, in this point of view of portfolio that we published a, a portfolio needs just for carbon dioxide removal last year at EFI. And there were 27 different portfolio elements just in carbon dioxide removal. So imagine now across the board, uh, uh, the, the kind of the onslaught that we need uh, this decade on, on innovation. Now in sequestration, there's again, I think been a lot of shifting uh, in the sense that uh, originally uh, the discussions of sequestration were focused mainly on uh, uh, what you'd call firm power. Uh, those have evolved to have a strong focus on, on industry 
and in today's report, we're going to see it's not either or, it's, it's and, yeah. uh, that uh, these are all going to be needed in California uh, as, well as, uh, as well as more broadly. So I think, I, I think there's a, a big focus, uh, um, a big focus shift, but within that, it's only elevated, in my view, uh, the focus that we, we will need CCS for different, for different regions of the country. California is one of those uh, that we'll hear is very, very well suited to that. Yeah, I, I, uh, I think that looking back on, uh, gosh, uh, a lot of work over the years that we have enough experience now with injecting CO2 uh, into the subsurface to know that we, if we choose sites well and operate them, uh, uh, the projects well, then we can do that safely. And the challenge now is to figure out how to get to a scale that uh, really matters. Um, and based on the study today, I think will show that, that California can play an important role in that. So, um, so could I say, uh, Lynn, just on that, on that, on getting sure. that scale, but I think what the report also shows is that the innovation push we need is not only in technology, but also in business models and yeah. policy slash regulation. Uh, and that will be, of course, a major focus. So, so um, Energy Futures Initiative has, has devoted considerable effort to thinking about decarbonizing California. Uh, I'm remembering the report that you uh, um, did last year on that topic. Can you can you say a word or two about the report and what the what was in uh, in all of that? Yes, uh, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, uh, in fact, the title of the report was Optionality, Flexibility, and Innovation. And those are three very important words. Uh, the subtitle was California's Pathway to Meeting Its uh, Aggressive Goals. Uh, and uh, in particular, what we showed is that the, uh, the California statutory goal for 2030 of a 40% economy-wide reduction, uh, what I'd say is it can be met. Uh, but uh, we also looked at 30 plus technology pathways and saw this is a real challenge. Uh, we got we to gotta hit on all cylinders. Uh, and I guess uh, in the, with the World Series going on now, I'd say we need a really, really high slugging percentage uh, to get there. And within that, uh, what we saw was the largest potential reduction uh, of CO2 in both the electricity and the industrial sectors would be if a strong push were made on CCS, particularly taking advantage of the incentives that are out there, the time limited federal incentives of 45Q, and of course the state incentives around uh, low carbon fuels, uh, for example. Uh, but without sequestration, uh, it looks awfully tough, um, even much tougher to, to meet those standards. Yeah, I think it's just another example of we we need all the tools that we can uh, use now, the ones we know how to do now, plus some more we need to invent going forward. And uh, uh, and that report makes that uh, that point, I think, very well. Um, EFI has also looked at the interplay of uh, clean energy and jobs. Um, how does CCS fit in, the, in that area? Well, our view has been that uh, look, clearly we're talking about here a very significant sectoral transition, an industrial transition, if you like, of the energy sector. And historically, those of, that, have, that has always led to uh, disruptions uh, uh, in work with workers, with, with communities. We think that to move uh, at the scale and the pace that we need to, we're going to need to address those issues because, frankly, not only is it the right thing to do, but we're just gonna have political headwinds if we don't uh, address the issues of workers uh, and, and, and community. So we look at it with, you know, with both sides of the coin. Now, having said that, uh, we formed a, a partnership uh, with the AFL-CIO called the Labor Energy Partnership. And uh, we listed 10 areas uh, that we think are very important for addressing climate and addressing the jobs issues. There are three of them that we are launching uh, right now, and carbon capture and sequestration is one of those three first, uh, first priorities. So the labor uh, sees CCS through the lens of climate uh, change risk reduction, but also through the, the lens of jobs. It's worth pointing out that a separate EFI study on the uh, energy jobs in the United States for five years pre-COVID, 
what we found is in the data that job creation in the energy sector outpaced the economy as a whole by a factor of two. So there's also the fact that if we put our shoulders to the wheel in getting this, uh, this work done uh, for the energy, energy transition, it's also a great leverage for, uh, for job creation, which we desperately need right now, uh, given the, the ongoing uh, economic effects of, of COVID. So it's, it's multifaceted. And finally, I just say that, look, one of the industries obviously with a lot of uncertainty is the oil industry uh, in the future. Uh, California has got hundreds of thousands of workers uh, in that industry. If we see a big sequestration, CCS uh, industry developed in California and elsewhere, that's also a great way to take care of some of these job issues because the skill sets, whether it's in the kind of the, the big chemical capture plant or the CO2 infrastructure, certainly the subsurface uh, uh, work that you know so well, uh, that's the skill set in that industry. So it's also a very interesting transition strategy on the job side, as well as on the key objective of, of carbon reduction, carbon emissions reduction. Yeah, I think there's there's no question that the the uh, that that many of the the, the sort of um, bits of uh, intellectual uh, property that that have to do with flow in the in the subsurface are uh, uh, apply just as well to CO two. Uh, in fact, a fair amount of the experience that we have with injecting CO two has come from that area. Maybe one last quick uh, question before we move on to the next thing. Uh, you mentioned the, the questions of carbon dioxide removal and the challenges there. Concentration of CO2 is in the air is pretty low, so, so that's a thermodynamic challenge for sure. Uh, but we might very well need it if we don't move, move faster on reducing emissions. Did the, is there, is there uh, a reasonable fit between the, these, uh, these uh, CCS and CDR um, uh, there as well? Well, sure, because if you capture all that CO2, you got to put it someplace. And until we, uh, we resolve the issue of economic utilization of CO2 on the gigaton scale, uh, it's, it's clearly sequestration. But also, I, I, we also forget in the negative carbon technologies, something that's actually fairly straightforward is BECS, bio, bio, uh, bioenergy uh, used for power production, for example, or hydrogen production uh, with carbon capture. Uh, uh, mentioning hydrogen, another area where sequestration can be a key enabler of uh, uh, at least in the next decade, decade plus uh, to, to blue hydrogen, uh, meaning using gas plus sequestration. So sequestration is also a major enabling tool for the negative carbon technologies uh, that we will need <laughs> almost, it's almost a tautology uh, for net zero and certainly for, for net negative. But I also don't want to lose track of the fact that we mentioned earlier that there's many, many other ways of doing negative carbon. And once again, we need like everything, including the kitchen sink, uh, if we're going to manage this problem. Yeah, I think that comes back to the point that you made early on, that, that uh, optionality is important. All of these uh, these approaches are going to have to compete their way into various marketplaces that will develop in ways that we don't foresee exactly right now. Uh, and having the option space be as full as possible gives us more uh, more ways to, to meet those challenges uh, as they come along. So, um, so uh, any, any final uh, parting shots before we uh, uh, turn it over to Melanie? Well, I, I, I think our conversation just reinforces that we agree on everything but one thing, <laughs> which I won't go back to. <laughs> well, now, now I remember a fair number of disagreements over the years of, uh, about the, uh, the, the cost of air capture and whether or not uh, we were gonna be able to pull that off. But uh, uh, those were uh, all in the spirit of, uh, of the, the, uh, the interesting debate about how, how to, to tackle a very, uh, a very interesting challenge. And now, so, and, now, and now net zero again. Yeah, indeed. So Big difference from when we were at DUE. That was not the language then. Yeah, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah. So there's, uh, there's no question that there's, uh, there's plenty to, to think about here. So my task now is to introduce uh, the two leaders of this study. Uh, the first is Melanie Kenderdine. 
Uh, Melanie is a managing principal of the Energy Futures Initiative with Ernie and a non-resident senior, senior fellow at the Atlantic Council, which is a, a Washington think tank. Melanie served as the, at the Department of Energy where she was uh, uh, the leader of the uh, Energy Policy and Systems uh, Analysis Group and a, uh, a counselor to the secretary. And she also helped to establish that, that other uh, energy uh, program, the MIT Energy Initiative and served as its executive director. Sally Benson uh, is a professor in the Department of Energy Resources Engineering in the School of Earth, Energy and Environmental Sciences at Stanford. She was an incredibly effective director of the Precourt Institute for Energy. And then before that, uh, uh, and in combination, Stanford's Global Climate and Energy Project. And before she joined Stanford, Sally was uh, Associate Lab Director for Energy Sciences at Lawrence Berkeley Na National Lab. And then in payment for uh, uh, doing a good job there, she became Deputy Director uh, at Lawrence Berkeley uh, as well. So uh, Melanie and Sally, take it away. Thank you everyone for joining us today. I hope all of you are healthy and safe. I'd like to thank our advisory board um, and the co-chairs, Ernie and Lynn were fabulous co-chairs, our sponsors and the members of our team from both Stanford and EFI for the incredible work they have done and for their shared commitment to deep decarbonization. Um, so let me get started. This is our study approach and the, the, um, the framing of the study. Uh, the analysis focused on five key areas meeting California's deep decarbonization targets and the critical role of that, uh, the status of CCS in California today, the opportunities in California, the challenges for CCS project development in the state, and a policy action plan for maximizing the value of CCS in California. And, and I'm going to give the bottom line up front. These were derived through a bottom-up process that we've been working on for the last seven months, but uh, the, the high-level goals an action plan, uh, comprise the action plan for policymakers, maximizing the value of CCS for meeting the state's economy-wide decarbonization goals, both affordably and equitably, motivating the private sector to decarbonize, enabling uh, economic and reliability uh, benefits from existing industries and power generation, and unlocking uh, new clean energy industry and jobs. So this is just a little bit about what uh, CCS can do in California and, and its value for emissions reduction. This shows California's 2017 emissions by sector and subsector lined up against uh, the results of our analysis. And Sally's gonna talk about this a little later in detail, but uh, suffice it to say that our conclusion was that CCS in California could uh, uh, reduce emissions in the state by as much as 15%. And when you look at that, the 15% um, doesn't sound like a lot at first, but that's 65% greater than emissions reductions uh, potential uh, from all of California's in-state power generation, 44% greater than emissions from the entire building sector in California, 84% greater than from the agriculture sector and 65% greater than all emissions for heavy duty vehicles. In short, CCS in California, while not the silver bullet, could be a major contributor to meeting the state's emissions reduction targets. Okay, these are slow. These are the goals that secretary uh, that we, we uh, looked at in, in, in part, some of the goals that we looked at, a 40% reduction by uh, 2030, uh, uh, carbon neutrality in 2045, net negative emissions thereafter. And this is about motivating the private sector in California to deeply decarbonize its options, operations. So that's expense, uh, uh, really uh, essential. Uh, Industry is 21% of total emissions. Uh, it has the largest, it's the largest manufacturing state in the country. And there are a few technology options for mitigating emissions in industry. And one of the industries we looked at, just to give you a sense of the value uh, cement has to the economy, it's about 2% of the state's emissions. Um, so it's, it's substantial, not huge, but um, it has almost 17,000 employees in cement and related uh, uh, jobs. It has a payroll of almost a billion dollars. It, it, uh, each year it puts about a half a billion dollars into uh, the state revenues. 
and its economic contribution to the state is $12.1 billion. I'm switching here to electricity and what CCS can do for reliability in electricity and how it can enable continued reliability benefits from clean firm power generation. And this is from the previous study that Lynn mentioned uh, of California. And what you are seeing there is every day of the year in California in 2017, blue is wind, red is solar. And the numbers that you see popping up are the numbers of days in California in 2017 where there was little to no wind generation. And, and uh, you have uh, 10 days in a row with no, gener uh, no wind, uh, a, a week in a row, seven, eight days in a row, five days in a row. The duration of battery storage right now is four hours. Um, there's also significant seasonal variation of wind and solar in California, wind and solar combined um, uh, in June of 2016, uh, and, and the difference between the, the uh, wind and solar combined in June and the wind and solar in January was 3.2 terawatt hours. That's seasonal, you can see on, on the last slide I showed you uh, that it's seasonal. Um, there's also significant variation in hydro um, uh, in 2015, prolonged drought reduced hydro generation to only about 7%. In 2017, it was 21%. Uh, it went down again in, uh, in January of 2018 as well. The conclusion of the previous slide I showed you <clears throat> and what I've just talked about, four hours battery storage, is that you need a fuel. Right now, that fuel is gas which according to Cal ISO provided 60% of the firm dispatchable generation uh, uh, last year. And um, that, that is very, very important to enable renewables and reliability. This shows you can enable continued reliability benefits from clean firm power with CCUS at a lower cost. Um, we're gonna focus on the two bars uh, on the right, the middle bar and the far right bar. This is capacity of the various uh, generation types um, with CCS and without CCS. No CCS is the middle, uh, the right is with CCS. What you see there, there is significant less capacity that is needed to meet demand with CCS. You need 31% less uh, battery capacity, that's the red on the bar. You need 23% less solar. NGCCs, natural gas, gets cut in half and if you add CCS. And, and the cost savings of those differences are $750 million a year, important for consumers. Why is this? Because when you add CCS to the NGCCs, the system operates much more efficiently. Massive redundancy of batteries and solar is not necessary to accommodate intermittency and NGCC capacity factors increase so less overall capacity is needed. Let me turn, uh, I think that uh, Secretary Moniz covered almost everything on this slide. This is unlocking new clean energy industry jobs. Um, over here on the left is carbon dioxide removal, direct, direct air capture. That when you capture the carbon out of the air, you need geologic storage. CCS starting now uh, can support that. Uh, direct air capture is very expensive. So we've got some innovation we need. Same with hydrogen from electrolysis. Hydrogen from electrolysis without emissions is four to five times more expensive um, than, than hydrogen produced from natural gas. If you capture the carbon from that uh, natural gas generated uh, uh, hydrogen, while we are innovating to get the cost down on electrolysis, uh, we will be building out an infrastructure that will be important from hydrogen. Also, this is the crosswalk between energy and, uh, I mean, uh, oil and gas jobs and CCUS jobs. And there are 317,000 oil and gas workers in uh, California. And, um, and those skill sets are very well suited to, uh, to CCUS subsurface uh, pipelines, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this is, uh, I'm gonna switch to international CCUS. Uh, IEA put out a, a CCUS global report. One of the conclusions in that report that came out last month was reaching net zero will be virtually impossible without CCUS. 
And they compared the stated policy scenario, which is everyone meets their Paris targets and their sustainable development scenario, 1.7 degrees by 2070. What technologies do you need to meet the difference between those two? Um, you need efficiency, you need renewables, fuel switching, nuclear, but you need 9% of the, the emissions reductions needed in that scenario are from CCUS. Um, this is the global CCUS industry. We've heard from several people that CCUS, oh, you can't do it right now, it's not commercial. This is a picture of what's going on in the world today. Um, the red bars, uh, the red large red circles, so there are 19 large scale CCS systems in operation under construction or completed. Um, uh, the, the, there are a whole lot of pilot scale projects around the world, but there are 19 large projects. So it's out there, it's commercial. Um, uh, this is uh, volumes of, uh, of CO2 that is stored. You can't see it, I'm sorry, I clicked through it. Um, but between uh, 2010 and 2018, uh, roughly 350 metric tons of uh, CO2 has been stored. This is a sap snapshot of the 10 existing projects in the US. Two are on hydrogen plants, three are on fertilizer plants, three are on gas processors or, or, or gasifiers, and one is on a coal unit. Some of the projects are transporting CO2 for storage on pipelines that are 205, 104, 83 miles long. Uh, so the infrastructure has been tried, tested, and, um, and uh, that's the point of that uh, this slide. Um, finally, a little bit on the status of CCS in California, the agencies of jurisdiction, that's on the left, and projects seeking LCFS, uh, low carbon fuel standard incentives are on the right. Um, uh, on the far left there, those are the agencies of jurisdiction for power generation, electricity, CEC, et cetera, et cetera. Over here on the, the right are the agencies of jurisdiction for industry. They're different, um, a CARB and, and uh, uh, CalGEM, et cetera, et cetera. There are some federal agencies in there, uh, e EPA. In here in the middle are the permits that all CCS uh, projects, whether they're electricity or um, industry would have to uh, meet uh, and, and get class six permits, class two permits, authority to uh, construct uh, and a permit to operate. Then down at the bottom there are project dependent permitting requirements. And that's very like location specific, size specific. Um, does it cross a federal lands? Is it in an, uh, does it affect endangered species? Is it in a California coastal zone? So, so those will be very project specific permitting requirements. Uh, there are a lot of them um, uh, and, uh, and we, we need to think about coordinating them. It's gonna be one of the recommendations that you'll see in um, when we get to the recommendations in this study. Those are the four projects um, uh, uh, utilizing uh, LCFS um, uh, credits. Uh, one is a hydrogen biomass facility in California. One is on an NGCC CHP combination. One is in Texas on an ethanol plant, um, but they sell bioethanol into California, so they're eligible for an LCFS. And one is in Texas on a DAC facility, which is also eligible under uh, the LCFS in California. And, uh, and now I'm gonna turn it over to Sally Benson, my colleague and co-director of the study. Okay, thank you very much, Melanie. And uh, again, my thanks to the uh, to the advisory board, to the sponsors of this project, uh, to our amazing team, and really thank you all for joining. Uh, it's really wonderful to see so many of you here. So uh, yeah, so I'm going to run through what we uh, a lot of the work we did in the project. And uh, we started with identifying those sources that might be suitable for carbon capture and storage and where they were located. We then assessed the opportunities for storage in the state. What was the potential? Uh, we then went on and did a techno-economic analysis, basically trying to answer the question is, under the current incentive structures, is CCS affordable? And finally, we did some work on uh, understanding social equity and community benefits that could arise from carbon capture and storage, uh, particularly looking at uh, benefits in terms of improving local air quality and, of course, jobs, as Secretary Moniz uh, spoke about earlier. 
So uh, let's uh, start with the um, emission sources from the industrial sector. Uh, we applied some screening criteria, uh, first over 100,000 tons per year so that it would be eligible for the federal 45Q tax credit. Also, we looked only at operating facilities that were reporting emissions in 2018. And then within refineries, of course, there are many sources and we only looked at the largest sources within the refining. So what did we find? Uh, about 35 uh, million tons of CO2 a year could be captured uh, with carbon capture and storage uh, from 51 facilities. Uh, on the left-hand side, you can see that the largest uh, amount was associated with hydrogen production from natural gas. Uh, second, combined heat and power, uh, typically inside the fence line of large industrial facilities, uh, cement plants, uh, you've heard about those refineries and, and finally ethanol. And you can see from this map that they're broadly distributed across the state. Now, moving on to opportunities in the electricity sector. Uh, again, we uh, applied a set of screening criteria. And in this case, particularly for retrofit, uh, meaning those facilities that were operating today that CCS could be added to them. So we only looked at natural gas combined cycle plants uh, built after 2000 with no planned retirement and with a capacity of greater than 250 megawatts, which then would again make them eligible for the 45Q tax credit. So what we found is there were 25 natural gas combined cycle plants that fit this criteria corresponding to 15 gigawatts of power capacity and these were emitting uh, 21.6 million tons a year. And as you heard about earlier, our modeling suggests that the, um, the, these plants would be operated with a higher capacity factor. There'd be many fewer, but they'd be operating at a higher capacity factor. So we'd be capturing at about 27.5 million tons a year. Uh, again, you can look at the map on the right and you see they're broadly distributed in the, in the state, uh, the darker ones being those we selected as retrofit candidates. Okay, so those were the sources. So the question is, is where, where could we put the carbon dioxide that is captured? And it turns out that there's a tremendous amount known about this. Um, a number of important studies have been done. Uh, the Department of Energy, uh, together with the California Energy Commission, uh, ran the West Carb program, which was focused on assessing um, capture and storage opportunities. The USGS then did its own independent study, and there's uh, excellent capacity in the national labs, uh, Livermore and Berkeley in particular, who studied this issue. So we took all of that data. We then applied screening criteria that uh, were over and above the, the, those included in the assessment. Uh, in particular, the low carbon fuel standard, which is uh, the, the largest incentive for CCS in California, uh, has some additional criteria. So we applied those. And of course, all the US EPA's requirements for class six wells. Uh, so that was the first thing. The second thing is we applied additional screen, uh, which was basically an exclusion layer that shown by the pink on the left hand side here. So this accounted for, you know, avoiding areas with faulting or seismicity or areas with high population density, any uh, ecologically sensitive habitats or, or otherwise restricted lands. Then we did source sink matching, uh, and you can see that on the left. So basically the broad green zone in the middle of the picture are saline formations, and you can also see a number of uh, oil and gas reservoirs there. So the bottom line is that uh, we have about 70 billion tons or gigatons of CO2 storage capacity in saline formations and uh, anywhere from one to two in, in oil and gas reservoirs. So what that boils down to is if we were to store 60 million tons a year, as identified uh, in this study, you could do that for more than a thousand years. So California has very abundant and very high quality storage resources. 
Okay, so let's take a little closer look at the, at the emission sources and what it would cost to capture them from a technological perspective. On the left hand side, you can see the average uh, uh, emissions per facility. Uh, in NGCC, it's about a million tons a year. That's very in line with many projects that are operating today. Uh, and then down the line, we can see that the ethanol sources, for example, are the smallest ones. On the right hand side, uh, we can see the costs that, uh, that we are incorporated into our techno, techno economic studies. Uh, these were derived from uh, other studies that have looked at this, but uh, with some of our own screens as well. And you can see that capturing CO2 from ethanol uh, facilities is a relatively low cost. Uh, however, uh, capturing CO2 from the largest emitting sources, things like combined cycle and NGCC plants, uh, costs are significantly higher. And that will play into our analysis as I'll so show you shortly. So based on, based on taking this uh, information, we can uh, develop a cost curve uh, that incorporates every one of these individual facilities that we identified. And uh, on the, on the x-axis there, we have how many million tons of CO2 could be captured a year uh, for a particular cost. Uh, and the way to read this, if the, if, the, if the bar is below the zero line, that means it's profitable for, for somebody industry to do it today. If it's above the line, that means it's not yet affordable. Now it's important to note that we've included um, the current financial incentives for carbon capture and storage in this analysis. And as I mentioned, the low carbon fuel standard uh, applicable to transportation uh, related emissions um, is, a, is a currently a, a, a valued at about $200 a ton. We decided to take quite a conservative approach and only included the value of that at $100 a ton. And second, we incorporated the 45Q tax credit. So what you can see when you apply these is about 20 million tons of CO2 could, uh, per year could be uh, profitably captured. And these include things like hydrogen generation, uh, ethanol facilities, uh, refinery emission sources. On the other hand, we can see that there's another 40 million tons that with today's incentives are just simply not economical. And that includes the large sources such as the natural gas combined cycle plants and of course the uh, cement plants as well. Okay, so we also did a very detailed analysis of the infrastructure build out that would be required to support this. Uh, and, and there are some plants that are actually co-located with very good storage resources. Uh, so those are shown by some of the black dots in the middle. However, we identified there are many sources that are located in regions where there aren't uh, nearby sources. So a gathering system to, to pull together the CO2 and then transport it to a good storage hub would be needed. So we identified a Northern California hub system, Southern California hub system, uh, a desert a salt and sea uh, gathering system, and then finally uh, Central California and South Bay gathering system that would be required to economically and efficiently take advantages of economies of effort and economies of scale in, uh, in this endeavor. Okay, I mentioned that we also uh, looked at uh, the social equity and community benefits of, of choosing to deploy uh, CO2 capture and storage. And it turns out that um, many of the industrial facilities with high CO2 emissions also emit high levels of criteria, airport pollutants such as sulfur dioxide, nitrous oxide and particulates. Now, if you want to deploy carbon capture and storage on those facilities, you need to clean up those emissions first. So if you were to deploy carbon capture and storage, you would necessarily have to make significant reductions in those other pollutants as well. So there are also benefits in terms of local economic activity. Um, Facilities would generate construction jobs, operations jobs, maintenance jobs. Uh, and then there are also significant multiplier effects across the supply chain that drive other uh, economic uh, benefits. And finally, there's the opportunity for job creation and preservation. 
uh, new jobs uh, in, in carbon capture and storage, but also taking advantage of the skill set of, of refinery and chemical plant operators and, and subsurface geoscientists uh, to put to work uh, in this area. Okay, so uh, so given all these opportunities, one would say, well, you know, why aren't we doing this? 20 million tons of CO2 could be profitably captured today. Uh, so we decided to interview uh, a large number of, of uh, organizations who were engaged with this, a total of 59 organizations and, and many more individuals, technology developers, uh, industry leaders, power producers, project financers, uh, as well as NGOs um, we engaged. And, and what we identified through this is that there were a number of key issues around ambiguity, regulatory complexity, financial uncertainty, and, and broad-based awareness uh, and public support of this technology. So I'll jump into these uh, in a little bit more detail. Uh, so, so on one hand, I mentioned that the state of the low carbon fuel standard currently uh, $200 per ton of CO2, CO CCS is eligible there. So it, one could say these appear to be very strong incentives. On the other hand, um, CCS is ineligible under cap and trade. So for example, cement plants, which are not eligible for, um, for the LCFS, um, are not profitable today. If, they, if the um, cap and trade system were applicable to CCS, today those cent, uh, cement plants could be profitably uh, implementing car uh, carbon capture and storage. Second issue has to do with the complex and untested regulatory process. Now, clearly it's very important to have public engagement and to have a uh, robust uh, 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 permitting requirements for all of these facilities. But one of the challenges today, because this is an untested process and relatively new, there's a great deal of uncertainty about timelines. So if you're a project developer and you don't know if it will take you three years to get your permits or, or, or 10 years to get your permits, uh, it puts a real damper on your ability to make a, an investment decision to go ahead. Uh, another source of concern is the revenue and cost uncertainty, uh, which make it difficult to finance projects. And in particular, I'll focus on one, the, the, the low carbon fuel standard. Um, today that's valued at $200, but it's really not clear what it would be valued at in, in the future. And if you wanna to go to the bank uh, and you don't know the value of that cr uh, critically important incentive, it's difficult to develop project finance. And then finally, um, CCS is a relatively new technology. And even though there are 19 projects and we're today we're storing, capturing and storing 40 million tons of CO2 a year worldwide, uh, the, the, the perception is that this is still a, a relatively untested and, and people are not clear whether CCS works. So there's a, a education that's needed. And also there are varied opinions about uh, the, uh, how important this will be in deep decarbonization. So back to you, Melanie. Hey, thank you so much, Sally. Uh, what, uh, this is the solutions, the solutions chapter. And, and the figure um, uh, is, it's a complicated figure, but I actually think it says a lot. And um, the, this is the pyramid figure. At the top are the high level goals. I mentioned those earlier, so I won't go into them uh, in, in any detail. At the bottom are California's strong foundations, and we've talked about those uh, as well. Good geology, large industrial base with few technology options, et cetera, et cetera. But then we identified uh, key drivers, and those drivers are now at the, at the bottom of each of the, uh, the sections above foundations. And, and the key uh, drivers are near-term action for meeting climate targets key enablers of carbon neutrality. And then finally at the top, opportunities for global leadership uh, on CCUS. It's not just opportunities for leadership, it's opportunities for markets. Uh, you saw what I showed you from IEA and, and, uh, and the world needs CCS technologies. Um, the various boxes there identify policy recommendation focus areas. Okay, within those uh, boxes, 
Um, there, are, there are many different uh, recommendations, specific recommendations. And you see there near-term actions, affirm, or affirm state support for CCS, issue guidance for CO2 storage, et cetera, et cetera. And again, these are all detailed in the study and, and Sally and I are just gonna discuss a few. Okay, and, and this near-term actions, and I'm just gonna talk about a couple of those. Um, uh, issue policy guidance to clarify CCS eligibility. Um, uh, California should incorporate CCS into its biennial integrated resource plan and long-term procurement planning process. And California should make CCS eligible an eligible resource under SB 100 goal of 100% of retail electricity sales from renewable and zero carbon sources by 2045. And then skipping over to the right, develop state supported CCS demos with industry. Um, underneath that larger category are a couple recommendations. California should consider supporting a large CCS demonstration project to help overcome high at risk costs in the project's early stages, untested permitting processes throughout the value chain and public acceptance of CCS. And then California should prioritize projects that have demonstrable local air quality benefits. There's a large section of discussing how there are air quality benefits um, uh, from CCS. Local job opportunities are created as well um, and to do those in line with the state's climate and equity goals. And I'm gonna turn it back over to Sally for uh, the next uh, couple of sections. Okay, great, Melanie, thank you. So. Secretary Moniz mentioned that when he and uh, and uh, and um, Professor Orr were in the Department of Energy, the idea of net zero and carbon neutrality hadn't fully uh, been established. But now that we know that we're headed for net zero and we need to do it relatively soon, we and that CCS is an incredibly important part of this. Uh, we need to start thinking about how can we enable the technology that's going to get us there things like hydrogen economy, uh, things like carbon capture and storage, negative emissions. So, so some of the key actions that can be taken, I'll, I'll just actually highlight two. One of them is the state uh, could begin to set uh, statewide targets for carbon removal. That, that would be really uh, incentivizing for people getting, getting going on this. But, but a very important one is to incorporate CCS uh, protocol in the cap and trade. So uh, I mentioned that uh, cement plants, for example, it would now be economical if they could take advantage of 45Q tax credit plus uh, cap and trade uh, to begin to implement this. So that would be a key action for really stimulating industry to get engaged in economy-wide decarbonization. And specifically, the CARB could uh, the, the the CARB protocol for the LCFS could be incorporated into the cap and trade program. So, Melanie, next one, please. Okay, and finally, you know, California, you know, is certainly a, a leader today, um, and uh, and. There's so much that needs to be done around the world and California uh, can continue to, to be a world leader by again, helping CCS uh, get off the ground. And I'd like to focus on one particular area and, and that is uh, the need for clean firm power. Uh, there have been a number of recent studies, uh, including one that was led by uh, Jane Long uh, of the Environmental Defense Fund that made the point that the clean firm power, meaning power that you can turn on and off when you want to, uh, but has uh, low to no emissions, really enable the, the deployment of massive amounts of, of renewable generation. And one of the things that is, that is an opportunity in California is to really assess what, how much clean firm power do we need in our grid as it's decarbonizing. And, and what is the role of clean firm power in reliability planning? And what are the key technologies within the state? You know, we've talked about natural gas combined cycle with CCS a, as a technology that provides clean firm power, but there are others as well. Uh, and then finally, what are those policy options that are going to economically support the scale up and deployment of these technologies that are going to be essential 
for, uh, for future reliability and affordability of our electricity system. Thank you. My first task here is to introduce the, the panel. We have a remarkable group of, of folks today who have very broad experience across the, the full spectrum of, uh, of uh, areas where carbon capture and storage uh, will have to play. Uh, so let me say a word uh, to them and then we'll uh, start with some questions and hope that we manage to save some time for uh, audience questions as well. So first is Jane Long. Uh, Jane is the Kravis Senior Contributing Sciences, uh, Scientist at the Environmental Defense Fund. Uh, she's a former Principal Associate Director at Large for Energy and Environment at the Lawrence Livermore National Lab. Uh, and she's been very much involved in EDF's work on geoengineering and evaluation of nuclear power and wastewater from the oil and gas industry. Deepika Nagarbushan is uh, uh, at the Clean Air Task Force. She leads the, the task force on decarbonized uh, fossil energy, which develops policy and advocacy strategies aimed at making carbon capture, utilization, and storage technologies available around the world by mid-century. Uh, before joining the Clean Air Task Force, she spent five years with Schneider Electric. Keith Pronsky is the president and CEO of Clean Energy Systems. Uh, he's a mechanical engineer with more than 30 years experience in the power industry in North America and South America and in Europe. And prior to his work at CES, he served as the vice president of business development at Latin America for Tractable. Uh, Kate Gordon is the director of the governor's office of planning and research. Uh, and senior advisor to the governor on climate. Uh, before she was appointed as OPR director, uh, she was the founding director of the Risky Business Project, which focused on quantifying the economic impacts of climate change uh, on US energy demand, crop yields, coastal infrastructure, as well as on uh, uh, human health and mortality. Uh, and then finally, uh, Trudy Sunset uh, is the CEO of Gasnova. Gasnova was established by the Norwegian government in 2005 to further the development of technologies and knowledge related to carbon capture and storage, and in addition to this, to serve as advisor to the government. Uh, Trudy has uh, 30 years of business experience with a focus on energy and environment and climate issues, uh, and she's, uh, uh, she, she has a lot of experience in actual deployment of uh, uh, CCS as well. So let me start with uh, uh, Jane Long. Jane, um, last month, the governor signed an executive order that will phase out sale of gas powered cars by 2035. Um, uh, I think that means that they're going to be electric cars. Um, and then there's a whole lot of other electrification that's going to have to happen in the, in the California economy as well if we're going to uh, meet these goals. Uh, Talk about how this fits together with the infrastructure, with the grid, with, with all the pieces that have to happen to, to pull this off. Well, that's a great question. Um, thanks, Lynn. I think there's, uh, there's a lot of stuff that we know about that, that issue and some things that we don't know uh, and, and really desperately need analysis. Um, we just completed a study looking at what uh, how the system could work in 2045 when the state is required to eliminate emissions from electricity, just assuming flat out a doubling of demand, uh, which is likely with all this electrification, including electrification of transportation. And what we saw there is that the need for clean firm power is pretty overwhelming, um, that it's going to cost significantly more for the state to try to do it without clean firm power and it probably won't work. Uh, it'll be limited, highly limited by land use uh, limitations on solar power, for example. The need for new transmission will go up by an enormous amount. So uh, if we tried to do it without clean firm power, and if you look at California, as you guys have, have analyzed, one of the best ways to get clean firm power in California is uh, carbon capture and storage with, with natural gas. So I think that, that um, our study definitely confirms the direction that you're going with um, with this study. Uh, we were technology neutral about the clean firm power, uh, but in point of fact, it's pretty hard to imagine um, the magnitude of what we need without some form of a clean of um, carbon capture and storage, because even if it's gonna be fuel, um, it, it, 
the most likely pathways will include some kind of, of sequestration, capture and sequestration. But I do want to say one thing uh, more about your question. I don't think there is a good study to date that links all of these changes together for heat, for industry, for transportation and electricity, and really evaluates whether uh, we have a reliable system in plan. And we, I think we don't. We simply don't. Uh, and so the time of use issue, which you, uh, which Melanie so beautifully explained, um, and the the variability that we we're building into the system because it's cheaper. You know, it's cheaper to put the the solar on because it's you know so it's such a small amount of money for a kilowatt, but it makes everything else intermittent. Every, if you put one intermittent thing on and make it your major source, it makes everything intermittent. And so all of those, the economies of that um, have to balance out and it has to balance out so that you um, end up being able to provide energy, not just electricity, whenever people need it. And we don't have an integrated study that links all those things together. So I think you're right that the, uh, the, it, it is uh, the system now, uh, there's, it, there's a benefit from, uh, from having it be diversified. Um, uh, it has uh, uh, options for more reliable uh, operation, but how it all fits together is, uh, is something that, uh, that we've, um, uh, you know, we've, those of us who work on the technology side uh, like to focus on a particular technology, but uh, your point is that the system matters, and I, I think that's uh, absolutely right. Uh, Deepika, at the, at the Clean Air Task Force, you've uh, focused on making uh, uh, carbon capture and storage uh, widely available around the, the, um, the, uh, the world. Um, what's going on around the world? What are some key trends that you've seen in other countries around the world uh, in this area? Thanks, Lynn, for that question. Um, there's a few good trends that, that are exciting to talk about. You know, firstly, uh, I would say that there is a growing climate ambition across uh, several countries, uh, Europe in particular. There, that means that there's um, commitment uh, also being made to reaching carbon neutrality by mid-century. Second, there's a realization that CCS is now essential to meeting those goals and that there's probably no way we're going to do it without CCS. So that basically means that there's potential for comprehensive policy roadmaps to, to, to integrate CCS into our plans and to make a plan for uh, leveraging the technology uh, uh, that is available. And then finally, there's uh, you know uh, different business models being attempted and there's actually government investment going into making these projects successful. And I just want to go a little deeper on in some of the, onto um, the project piece, specifically because I want to highlight the business model um, uh, aspect of it. Um, so European Commission, um, U European Union Commission last year uh, announced that they want to go to uh, 20, com climate neutrality by 2050. We've heard that from several states uh, within the EU as well. We've got Germany wanting to uh, tighten its targets. Uh, we've got Netherlands also wanting to do deep reductions uh, in alignment with that climate neutrality goal. Um, and the thing is that there are projects that are actually actively being supported. In Norway, I know Trudy is going to speak later, but Norway is definitely a front runner in this, a leader, um, you know, actually committing money uh, by supporting, by using more than uh, $2 billion to support the development of the Longship project, which is not just capture, it's capture, transport, and storage. Um, and the same thing is happening in the Netherlands where, uh, you know, government is supporting the development of a business model where, um, you know, a whole infrastructure, a whole cluster and hub model is being developed at the port of Rotterdam where, you know, there's going to be multiple sources using common infrastructure to transport the captured CO2 and to store it, which is very much in alignment with the opportunities that are currently available in California based on uh, the report that you just highlighted. So I just wanted to, you know, highlight that these business models are available. And it's not just, you know, and I, it, they're not just ideas, they're actually even operational. If you look at Canada, we have the same business model being applied with the Alberta Carbon Trunkline project where the government, both the federal and state governments, uh, funded the oversizing of a pipeline that connects currently two uh, projects to its uh, storage site. Um, but the pipeline can actually capture, uh, transport 10 times or more than 10 times of what it's currently capturing. So that oversized capacity was funded by the government. These are great ideas. 
to make it work even Cal in California. And um, you know, those are the main highlights I would like to, uh, I, I wanted to highlight here. So, uh, so some competitors are, uh, are, are already out there uh, working hard, but uh, with lessons for all of us. Uh, Keith, uh, uh, Jane mentioned the, uh, the hydrogen business uh, as a, uh, an area of interest here, uh, and it certainly has a potential role with the, um, uh, a, uh, um, with the, the um, executive order for transportation, but also in the, potentially in the area of, uh, of uh, power generation because uh, hydrogen uh, uh, can be stored and, uh, and run through a gas turbine as well. Um, can you talk about clean energy systems, uh, about the, what, what you're up to and how this will uh, play in either uh, transportation, CCS, and, and what the opportunity looks like? Yeah, sure. Thank you, Lynn, and I uh, really appreciate the opportunity to uh, speak to you all. Um, yeah, we've been working really for the last several years on carbon negative energy projects. Uh, earlier, uh, Secretary Moniz referred to them as BEX bioenergy with CCS. And, and what, we're, what we're trying to do is take advantage of what is a depressed biomass power market in California with the world's highest price carbon pricing linked to the transportation sector. So roughly half the biomass plants in the state have closed because when their PPAs expire, they compete against new wind and solar and they lose out. So we have a situation where the biomass industry has collapsed. And so our idea is to take these stranded assets that are largely in the Central Valley and convert them into carbon negative energy plants. It's really an indirect uh, air capture model that produces transportation fuels, either electricity or hydrogen uh, as a byproduct. So the basic idea is the carbon dioxide obviously goes into the trees, into waste, ag, ag waste. And we take that and instead of burning it in a conventional boiler, we gasify the fuel and we produce a syngas. And in that syngas is hydrogen. So we can extract that hydrogen. We call it the cheap hydrogen. We just simply remove that with uh, membranes. And what's left is the hydrogen depleted syngas. And that's mainly, that's where all the CO2 is, or all the carbon uh, in the form of methane, carbon monoxide, and carbon dioxide. So what we do is we burn that in our power cycle, which is essentially modified rocket engines, and we're burning with pure oxygen. So we make steam and CO2. We can use that to power turbines, and that electricity runs the process. It can also have excess electricity that goes to the electric vehicles uh, and charging stations. And at the backside, since we have steam and CO2, when you cool that down, you get water and CO2. They naturally separate. We compress the CO2 and we store it in saline aquifers, uh, saline formations right on site. So there are no CO2 pipelines. So these are facilities in the Central Valley. Uh, we're currently working on four sites. And we did submit uh, the Class 6 uh, EPA uh, permit for storing CO2 back in January of this year. So we're in active development and we hope to have the first plant or plan to have the first plant online in uh, 2023 timeframe. And the first four projects will be removing about 1.3 million tons per year of CO2. And then this model can be scaled up. And in total, if you were to convert all the biomass plants in California, you'd be looking at removing about 10 times that, about 13 to 15 million tons of CO2. So basically you have CO2 or CO2 from the air going into the plant, we store the CO2 and the hydrogen can go to the hydrogen highway and for every mile driven, you pull three pounds of CO2 from the atmosphere. So uh, it really is carbon negative hydrogen. The same can be done with electricity going to electrolyzers to produce hydrogen on site or in refineries. Yeah, so it, uh, it really is uh, carbon dioxide uh, removal. Uh, Using uh, those those plants, which uh, I have to say the uh, they might not be the most efficient efficient sources, but there are lots of them, and they uh, and they uh, they've been using billions of years of uh, evolution to figure out how to do it. So there's a, there's something to be said for that. Um, Kate, that that makes it a natural question uh, for you to talk about the role of uh, carbon dioxide removal for uh, helping the state uh, achieve uh, carbon neutra neutrality. So, so I know that's something you've been working on. So uh, uh, go for it and tell us about it. 
Thanks so much, Lynn. And uh, um, it is a great segue. I, we, we're in, in, in this administration really focused on looking across the board at a very integrated approach on how to get to our climate goals. We, we need to do that because we have increasing, as everyone knows, increasing and increasingly severe climate impacts today. We need to do that to meet our goals that we've been very clear about going out to 2045. We see carbon dioxide removal as a necessary part of that larger approach. I think the California approach on climate for a long time, and it's, you know, we're building on an amazing record from Governor Brown, but for a long time has been primarily focused on the technologies and programs that will help us to bring down carbon emissions through a number of programs and regulatory standards. We've been less focused up till now, I would say, on both carbon dioxide removal and also on climate resilience. And both of those are real priorities for the governor and very clear parts of our overall strategy. You know, the science points us there, all the reports point us there. I don't need to repeat all the things that have been said. Um, we, we, we clearly have to be getting this stuff out of the atmosphere at the same time that we're aggressively uh, reducing risk from existing impacts and aggressively reducing future emissions. Um, that, and uh, Jane, I thought Saad said this really well, it requires a really integrated approach. This is not just a technology question. It's a land use question. It's an economic development question. It's an environment question. It's a jobs and equity question. It really goes across many, many parts of the government. And, and those who've been in federal or state government at this scale know that there's a lot of silos um, in our government. But I will say that under this administration, um, we are really taking an extremely integrated look at our climate policies. And I think there's a couple of signals on that. Um, obviously the transformation of Dogger, the, the, the oil and gas regulatory agency to CalGEM, which is a recognition, frankly, that this is a larger carbon energy management conversation than it is an oil and gas conversation. So just expanding the mission and the mandate and bringing in some really exceptional people to that agency as well as to resources under which it sits. Um, we are doing interagency uh, uh, task forces in a very intentional way around a number of related areas. The most central is frankly a, a interagency task force on engineered carbon removal. So we're, we're looking very specifically at this issue um, and particularly focusing on some of the things that were called out in the study, hard to decarbonate sectors, resident, uh, residual power, non-combustion BECs, and I have to emphasize the non-combustion, California has a pretty strong policy um, uh, uh, direction on that, and, um, and potentially direct air capture. We're, we're looking at that like everyone is. We also, I should say, have related interagency processes on, um, on feedstock, on woody biomass, because we have a whole lot of non-merchantable wood coming out of the forest right now in California. We need to figure out what to do with it. Um, that's, a, that's actually a huge priority for us as well as just transition. The governor in his executive order on zero emission vehicles called for my agency with labor to put together a just transition roadmap. And there's a lot of intersections um, uh, as, as the secretary pointed out between these issues. So we have a number of these interagency processes really with a goal of providing more consistent policy signals and ultimately more consistent approaches and operational processes on these issues. The governor has been really clear that when we have a clear policy direction that aligns with our climate and equity values, he wants us to have a business relationship that as he said, is red carpet, not red tape. He's very clear on that. So we're working on that clear policy direction so that we can um, do better alignment and better, uh, better integration. The last thing I'll say is that, you know, you mentioned this, but the LCFS, the low carbon fuel standard, already envisions all of the things I talked about. I mean, we are in fact providing the most valuable price signal on this issue of any place. So um, we feel good about that, but we do fully recognize that we need to be locating that policy within, again, a more consistent vision, a more consistent set of policies, and a more um, uh, streamlined and, and integrated set of policies. And that's where we're heading. So I, I think that those of us who love to work on the technology side of all this uh, need to be reminded uh, periodically that uh, that uh, our energy system is not the only system that matters here. Uh, we need to, we have a system, uh, a, a regulatory system, we have a permitting system, we have uh, a variety of incentive programs that all fit together, uh, as you say, to, to uh, we hope have a, an integrated uh, uh, approach to all this and that the design of those systems is every bit as important as, uh, as uh, figuring out how to move the power around on the grid. So, um, 
so I think that that brings us to, Trudy to a, um, uh, a question that uh, I'm sure is on the mind of others around here. And that is that, uh, uh, you know, we're, we're, uh, we're talking uh, uh, about all these uh, systems and doing it in, uh, in California. But in fact, you've been doing it for quite some time. Uh, uh, gosh, I think didn't Sleipner start in 1996 or thereabouts. So Norway has uh, a more experience uh, in CO2 injection than almost anybody. Um, could you talk a little bit about the, the history with CCS and what issues have come up and and uh, and how's it uh, how how's it all worked there? Thank you and thank you for inviting me. I wish I could be there in person. It seems like such a long time ago since I was uh, uh, at the Global Climate Action Summit in San Francisco. So I hope I'll be able to travel soon again. Um, yes, you're right. Uh, it started actually in the early 1990s in Norway with politician that. Uh, uh, they started an offshore CO2 tax, uh, which was very high in the range of $50 per ton. And that created uh, a CCS solution at a gas field offshore, the Sleipner project, which is quite a famous uh, project for people interested in CCS. And we did a lot of, of research and, and to study uh, openly sharing with uh, um, independent research organizations and universities so that uh, we could make sure that the um, uh, stakeholders looked at this as a safe solution and that we understood what happens once the CO2 is stored. So we, in fact, we have uh, 24 years of experience of doing CO2 storage and not just doing the storage, but really monitoring what's going on. And then on top of that, then we had an LNG facility built in 2007, the Snovit project. And that used the same solution, but build also a pipeline offshore. So this is about uh, using saline aquifers and storing CO2 several thousand meters below the seafloor. Now, um, uh, Gaslova is a state enterprise and we do this on behalf of the Norwegian government. And we have worked very closely with the industry because we need the industry to be in lead. So the policy makers can set up uh, the incentives but we need the industry to get on board. And for the past five years, we've worked with um, uh, cement industry and waste to energy. And we now have this long ship project that Deepika just mentioned. And the long ship project, the Norwegian government just proposed this fall, a $1.8 billion invest dollar investment in this project. And Gasnova is so fortunate to coordinate the project, but it is the industry that will construct and and uh, operate and own the facilities themselves. So this, the state gives support. But what is interesting is that we have um, put surplus capacity in the offshore store of that project. So we're actually offering, we're, we're building an open access infrastructure uh, so that other industries from other countries in Europe can send their CO2 to Norway for storage. So that is an interesting business model. Uh, in those almost $2 billion um, uh, budget, uh, we also um, include 10 years of support for operational costs. I think that's important. So the government uh, accepts that it's not commercial yet. The market is not there. We're just trying to make this happen and then invite others. We think this um, way of building infrastructure, and I see from your report in California that you're also thinking about this to combine different uh, mission sources with good stores with high capacity. Yeah, so it's um, uh, it, 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 the whole carbon capture business is interesting because there's the capture part, there's the storage part, and there's the move it around part. Uh, and all of those pieces uh, have uh, rules and regulations, of course, uh, as they should. So, um, so Keith could, could I ask you, you're the, you have the most direct experience uh, um, uh, of any of our panelists in the permitting process for CO2 storage in California. Uh, can, you, uh, can you say something about um, uh, your experiences so far and uh, um, you know, how's, how's it going? What have been the biggest challenges? Yeah, um, well, uh, I, I have to say um, it's been uh, going overall very, very well, especially the coordination between EPA and the state agencies, you know, primarily with CARB. 
Um, we've seen a lot of enthusiasm, a lot of support. Uh, so we, we, you know, we greatly appreciate that. I mentioned that we submitted our application in January. Um, one of the things that has occurred, obviously, because of COVID and, and uh, some furloughing and, and staff shortages is things are taking a little bit longer. Um, initially, the, the expectation was it could be done in a, roughly a year. And it, it may, I'm speaking of the class six uh, storage permit, um, it likely will go you know, a year and a half or something like that. But uh, uh, you know, as far as on a sort of a, the progress that we're making on sort of the, tech, the technical review and everything, that's all going quite well. Um, we are, of course, as we get further into the, the development and, and uh, other parties and agencies become involved, you know, there are some things that we are seeing, obviously. Uh, you know, one thing that would be helpful is you know, for all the subsurface activities, we're really involving a lot of different uh, agencies and permitting authorities, and that was mentioned earlier in the presentation. So we have the EPA, we do have CARB for permanence, and, and then uh, on a conditional use permit as well. Um, we're seeing differences in timing, differences in requirements. Uh, one of the recommendations, uh, you know, to have a lead agency, somebody who's really going to take the responsibility and coordinate that, we think that would be uh, quite helpful to, you know, for sure. Um, another area that's not resolved in California and is in other, some other states is uh, pore space. And who do you actually need to, you know, receive consent from and, and uh, uh, with respect to storing CO2, you know, nine or 10,000 feet in a saline formation? Is it the mineral rights owner, landowner, uh, and so on? Um, so having, you know, some, you know, sort of moving that policy forward because uh, it's kind of like open terrain right now, you know, just trying to find the right path forward. So obviously we're speaking to everybody. Um, and then, uh, you know, the, there's the, the issue of the financial responsibility, because again, there are differences there as well, uh, you know, from the EPA and from CARB, and it's trying to get some, you know, sort of unified approach on that would be quite helpful. But bottom line, overall, we're pretty happy with it. Yeah. Okay. So, so, so progress and, uh, and some more work to do that, that kind of sounds like our whole conversation as, <laughs> yes. as, a, as a matter of fact. Um, so uh, the, the time to move to questions from the audience has come. Um, so, uh, well, here's, a, here's an easy one. Um, uh, this is to any of you, but, uh, uh, but uh, I guess, uh, Kate, you, you might be first on the list. Um, other than uh, the low carbon fuel standard, what significant California policies are realistically on the horizon that would drive forward action on CCS and other decarbonizing uh, solutions? And I think really the, the sense of the question is, well, you know, is there anything here that we could, uh, that, that, that seems like a, a straightforward step that we could knock off early, uh, uh, even as we work on the tougher parts? Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question, um, uh, and I will give what probably will not be that satisfying of an answer, because the reality is um, that much of what we need to do, which you've all talked about in the report highlights, and actually Keith just highlighted, is, is coordination across agencies and is being clearer on things like the responsibility and accountability and, litigate, and um, liability issues. And so to me, um, I would say I mean, it wouldn't maybe be the questioner might not think this is a significant California policy, but I think just the fact of trying to identify and answer those questions under a clear framework of sort of where is the state going on carbon dioxide removal generally and on this set of issues specifically is really, really important. And that's mostly what we're working on, frankly, is just the clarity mm -hmm. of that direction. Um, I think we're about to enter a new scoping plan um, process for for CARB. We're going through, you know, a new update to Title 24 on building codes. There's a lot of policies that are in review right now. So what we're really trying to do is to clarify our own kind of policy direction, again, in alignment with our values on climate and equity, and then make sure that those are reflected in those processes. So maybe not satisfying, but I think probably useful given what people have said. Yeah, well, and not made easier by the, the virus situation, I'm, I'm quite sure. Jane, maybe you, uh, um, would you, um, if, if you had to pick off, um, you've, you've spent lots of time thinking about all the various pieces of this, if you had to pick off a near, a near term action, uh, is there any, do you have any favorites you'd like to share? Well, based on our study, the state is pretty clearly going to need about at least 30 gigawatts of clean firm power. And although you don't necessarily need that uh, right away, 
um, you may not need to have it in place until 2035 or 2040. And um, we've had some conversation with SoCal Edison, for example, where they said they've looked at this and it just doesn't work for them right now because it's more expensive. And so they don't necessarily need that firming because they still got the gas plants. Mm -hmm. So I think what California needs to do is put in place a uh, portfolio standard for clean firm power now and ramp it up to at least 30 gigawatts by say 2040, 2045 and, and get the planning in there because the economics are not gonna drive the preparation. And when, when it comes time that the economics are gonna make a lot of sense that you're gonna have to have it, it won't be there to buy. And so those economics will be worse. So we need some for planning for that. And I think a clean firm power portfolio standard that ramps up to 30 or 40 gigawatts by 2040, 2045 is about what we need. So here's here's uh, an important question and we'll see who wants to to uh, tackle it. And it's this is like a class as you know, if nobody volunteers then I'll call on somebody. So, uh, so be prepared. But uh, the question is, uh, how can the state uh, ensure that CCS deployment rectifies the disproportionate impacts on dis disadvantaged communities living at the fence line of large stationary emitters as opposed to exacerbating them. Um, anybody want to want to tackle that? Uh, Keith, go ahead. Yeah, I'll, I'll uh, take a shot at it because, and it just kind of goes to a comment that uh, Kate had made earlier. Um, again, a lot of carbon capture is associated with the fact that there's still a stack there and and uh, there are emissions, but there are, uh, car it's not just us, there's other oxy combustion technologies where it's, it's essentially full capture and you don't have the criteria pollutants. So um, when we uh, started working on these projects in the Central Valley, we found that a lot of the um, uh, environmental groups were uh, very concerned about even conventional biomass plants that even with pollution control equipment, mm -hmm. you know, you had source points of pollution next to impacted communities. And if you can come along and do it in a manner where you don't have the criteria pollutants, we're seeing that more than the carbon capture piece in the Central Valley, the fact that we can reduce criteria pollutants and, and knock down the open field burning, that these are going to be the key things. So, you know, uh, we're seeing the opposite where being able to, to bring jobs to these impacted communities, to not bring the point sources of pollution, to reduce the criteria pollutants, you know, that I think that there is a way to make it a positive. CCS should not be seen, and this goes to the comment about public education, as something that necessarily is bad for a community. It, obviously, it's technology specific, but there are ways to do it where it's beneficial and not harmful, obviously, to the community. Lynn, can I just jump in on this really quickly yeah, as well, if you don't mind? I, I think it's a really important question, and it actually goes to a larger question that I think all of us have to grapple with, frankly, who are in the climate space, which is, what's the role of industry? in a carbon neutral future. And what we've done in California for many years, we still are a large manufacturing space uh, state, but we have offshored a lot of manufacturing. Um, and ultimately when we're looking at that carbon neutral future, we're looking at transportation emissions, we're looking at jobs and local jobs and opportunity, and frankly, the need to keep having a diversified economy, which we know from COVID, um, crisis is incredibly important to trying to just survive um, as a resilient economy, we will need to in fact have industry in California. And I think it opens the question of where and how and how do we make sure it's as clean as possible. But my worry is that we start going down the path of getting rid of industry, which is actually not a good answer when, it, when you're looking at a carbon neutral future. Yeah, and again, I, I think that- Deepika, I was just about to call on you, but I see you're about to volunteer, so go uh, forward. Um, Sorry, Jane, but uh, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Quick. no, I, I, I think I agree. I, I, I think the question really is not, you know, to use um, CCS as an excuse to, you know, uh, create, you know, perpetuate any problems. In fact, CCS is a solution. It's a pollution control equipment, actually speaking. And so to the extent that some of the criteria pollutants do need to be cleaned up when someone has to put on CCS, that's well and good. But I, I suspect that you know in some situations there may be other air pollutants. So I don't think that we can ride on a CCS wave. I think that there has to be a separate, you know, targeted approach um, to removing uh, of these pollute uh, criteria pollution in in local communities where these um, 
facilities might survive even, even in a world where we have electrified light duty vehicles. And so it's, I, I just feel like we need to have, a, I just don't think that CCS can solve all the problems. Although CCS is extremely essential to meeting climate, climate goals such as carbon neutrality, yeah. it is very important to sort of look at this problem separately as well and sort of have a parallel program to bring it down to zero. Uh, yeah. along with CO2 emissions. Yeah, make, makes sense. Uh, Trudy, do you, 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 you've had maybe more experience than any of us in this, uh, in the question of public acceptance of uh, mm -hmm. carbon capture and storage. Uh, do you have any advice for California on, uh, on, on that? Uh, we're very fortunate that we also have our, in our mandate to share experience and knowledge. So we're happy to do so, of course, and you do have a lot of um, knowledge yourself. Uh, I think it's important to do stakeholder dialogue to en engage and to educate the public. And we have a lot of experience that we can share. And uh, I think that uh, public acceptance will still be very important in the future. But I think also I would like to add that we see a change in the industry. We see uh, that the industry is really getting engaged. So I don't think we need the stick as much as we need the carrot from the policymakers. I think the industry is getting ready. So I just wanted to mention very shortly that last week, uh, our project in Norway was joined by Microsoft, who wants to contribute with their technology knowledge. Uh, and uh, they want to, you know, how can you optimize CCS technology? How can you make it more efficient and cheaper? And at the same time, they have this target of being carbon negative by 2030. So they really are seriously looking for solutions for that. I think that's a great example of how we need to work together on a global scale uh, to, to sort out the climate issue. And I think it's, uh, I agree with Deepika, it's, it's not just a technology solution. This is the part of, of the future. And in 10, 15 years from now, we'll look back and think, what was, what was the pandemic? And why did we discuss whether we need CCS or not? Obviously it's a part of the solution. Yeah. So, um, so we're, we're nearly at the end, but I, there's one more question that I'm actually gonna answer because it's uh, in, my, uh, in my area. Uh, it, the question is, what happens over hundreds of years to, to the CO2 when it's injected into the saline reservoirs, um, and is it at risk of escaping? Um, and this is, this is a place where choosing the site well, that is uh, understanding have multiple barrier layers that prevent vertical flow um, upward, uh, that's a big part of it. Uh, it's also possible to monitor you, what's going on. You can monitor the pressures in various layers, and there are things you can do to mitigate if you if you see some movement. The main the main thing we need to be careful about is the wells. Um, but we know how to to make wells that don't leak, and to make wells that and to seal them up uh, when we want to to end it. Uh, so for projects that uh, that are designed well and operated well, uh, the risk should be quite low. Great, thank you, Lynn. And many thanks to our panelists, for all of you who joined us from around the world. This has been tremendous. Um, I'd like to thank the project team. Everyone put in a lot of hard work over the last seven months, and it's been a pleasure working with Stanford University and my colleagues at EFI on this effort. Um, we'd also like to thank our advisory board, which was chaired by Secretary Moniz and Professor Orr. So many thanks to all of the board members who provided subject matter expertise over the course of this study. And finally, um, this report would not be possible without all of our sponsors um, who are listed here on this screen. So many thanks to these foundations, organizations, and labor unions for supporting this effort. So we would also like to remind everyone that the study is now available and can be downloaded from the EFI and Stanford websites that are listed here on the slide. The video of today's events, as well as the slides, will also be made available. On behalf of Stanford and the Energy Futures Initiative, thank you for joining us today. <laughs>